practice with the microphone. Um, and we're going to have some really good conversations, I think, about kind of business impact, which is a really big thing that we're talking about in L&D. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Let me hand you over to Mike, first of all, and he can talk to you for a bit. Here we go. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Booth. I look after learning technologies at uh, Vodafone within our UK market. I've been uh, kindly asked along uh, this afternoon to uh, chat about some of the work we're doing in our retail division, looking at a platform called uh, Fuse. Um, we're using it in a, in a kind of a, a mobile way across, uh, across the retail organisation. Just, just before going any further, can I have a quick show of hands of who's heard of Fuse? Yeah, and is anyone actively using it? Yeah, one over. Okay, that's that's really useful because Fuse um, is used in a number of different ways. Uh, different organisations use it differently. From Vodafone's perspective, we're using it very specifically as a mobile-first platform, and we're using it to drive um, operational efficiency using a combination of learning, collaboration, and communication, and. As I go through the, the session here, I'll just give you a, a quick overview of what we're going to cover off. So first off, like, uh, like any learning solution, I'll start with what our business challenges were or our problem statements. I'll give you a, a quick whistle-stop tour of Fuse itself so you can get a flavour for what the mobile app looks like. And then there's three main areas that we're using Fuse for. Um, one is around learning um, and performance support. The other is around communications. And the final one is around observational assessment. So I'll spend some time picking into, uh, into, into those three areas. Um, I'll share our operating model, so how we underpin it, how we're setting ourselves up to, uh, to manage Fuse, and then just share some of the results we're starting to see from the, uh, from the tool itself. Okay, I'll go through this at, um, at quite a reasonable pace, but if you have got any questions as we're going through it, give us a yell and we'll, uh, we'll stop and pick those up. So, <clears throat> what were our business challenges? So, so there were four main challenges. Um, first one was our guys across the retail estate were spending far too much time in the classroom and not enough time with the customer. So we needed a way of fixing that and flipping that around so that they were spending less time in the classroom, more time with the customer, and we had a more flexible way of getting learning and communication out to them, and in turn, a more cost-efficient way. The next one was really by virtue of retail estates. They're kind of silo in their nature. Uh, what that actually means is we've got lots of talented individuals uh, across retail, lots of experience, but unfortunately the, the only people to benefit from those guys are the ones that are sat in the same store with them. So we needed to find a way of extracting that knowledge out of the, that talent, out of that experience and spreading it across the, uh, the, the wider estate. The next one was really around communication. So our communication strategy was very, very hit and miss, uh, coming out from HQ to the 500 and odd stores, um, very dependent on line managers, email to line managers, usually attachments with PowerPoints or PDFs, and um, you know, no way of understanding the penetration rate, whether it penetrated at all, very old hat, kind of reading a document, not interactive, um, and, and very low tech. Um, so we needed a way of getting better at that. And finally, we needed to take our guys through a, a behavioural shift from having conversations with our customers that were really price and device focused to having richer conversations around finding out about the customer and profiling the customer and coming up with solutions that were fit for purpose for that customer and also focusing on our, on our commercial priorities. So those were the four big problem statements that we wanted to solve. But also, we've got a number of factors that we need to uh, consider in addition to those problems, um, or those problem statements. Um, namely, we didn't just want a solution for, for the, uh, the guys in the stores. We wanted it to be fit for purpose for the retail guys who are based in HQ, so the central functions around learning and comms and that type of stuff. Um, the guys out in the estate, they're bits of kids really, well, compared to me they are, they're bits of kids, and they've been brought up with smartphones, they've been brought up with consumer-grade apps, so we really needed to um, you know, play into that and, uh, and work, um, work that to our advantage. Um, however, a lot of those kind of smartphones that the guy, these guys had were their own personal smartphones. It's only the store managers that had their own business smartphones. So we needed to factor a kind of a bring your own device strategy into whatever we we're going to do as well. Um, our 
terminals within the stores were, were okay, but the specs weren't, weren't brilliant, further pointing to a, a mobile solution as opposed to desktop solution. And our stores are really busy places, lots and lots of footfall. Um, but like anywhere, you have some troughs as well as the peaks. And the, the trick that we were trying to solve there is making use of those troughs. So really driving efficiency rather than, you know, the 10 minutes between customers sitting doing nothing. Let's play into that with some learning, with some comms, and uh, we needed a vehicle to enable us to do that. And then, uh, you know, a couple of standard ones um, around where we get our data from. It was a given that we needed to bring our data in from our, our HR system, uh, get some quality uh, and robust data in there. And it goes without saying that this needed to be a secure solution, particularly when we're talking about bring your own device as well. So we had to go through the, the red tape and the hoops with our security guys to get where we wanted to go. So, um, when we looked at all those requirements, we, we started chatting to uh, a company called Fuse, and it soon became apparent there's a real good match there for what we were trying to do and what they could offer us. That led us to the solution. So that led us to um, kind of what I'm predominantly going to talk about for the, the rest of the session. What I want to do before I start to dig into some of this in, in any detail is just give you a, a kind of a whistle-stop tour of some of the, the screens so you get a feel for what it, what it looks like. I'll dip into one or two here uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to kind of the, the learning element and the comms element. But one in particular I want to point out here is the accessibility. So once they've downloaded the app, from uh, either the, the, the Google Play Store or the iOS Store um, and logged on for the first time through a, you know, a secure means of doing that, the app is there on their phone one click away. So accessibility has been one of the real key secrets to um, this being successful for us. They're in the store, they've got the phones literally in their hands, one click and the learning or the comms is there in front of them. And that has really uh, made a difference to, you know, terminal ways of doing things or other kind of solutions where you know it may be you know a laborious login process if they can remember the password and then you know 10 clicks before they're at some content and the second big one is and the home page kind of demonstrates it and it's really around this isn't a hierarchical based infrastructure it's a community-based infrastructure and they're, they're very different so we take the the, the data from SAP, it builds your, your infrastructure. And um, as an advisor out in one of, my, uh, one of the stores, I'd belong to two communities. The first community would be the whole of retail community. And that's, they see everything. Um, and we pump the formal stuff out within that community. So everyone sees it, whether it's learning, whether it comes, um, and it comes into that uh, knowledge feed. But secondly, I'm uh, also a member of my regional community, uh, about 30 regions. We've got uh, about 130 guys in, in each region and that regional community is more of a social community. So not only can they receive regional stuff, maybe from their regional manager and stuff like that, but they can actually go on and post content of their own, tips and techniques, anything they want to do on there, they're at liberty to go on and post stuff. So as an advisor, I would actually see both the central content coming out in my knowledge feed and the regional stuff. So it's very relevant to myself. Let me just pick out one on this screen. So we'll look at learning plans in a minute and, and observations. But the one I want to talk about here is, is notifications. So if we talk about um, email across our estate, that, that kind of was the, with the key way of communicating prior to us having Fuse. What Fuse has enabled us to do is more or less switch email off altogether and notifications through the Fuse app becomes the primary way of receiving communication. They'll get a ping on the smartphone, they'll go in and it'll take them straight to the content that we want them to see. So that's what it looks like. Let's start to look in, uh, in more detail at learning and performance support. And um, I class these really as the, the three Ps that we do with learning and performance support, push, pull, and post. So if we look at push first off, Push is really about structured, blended learning. It's about our strategic programs that we want to put each of the guys through. And what it gives the, uh, the guys there on their phone is the ability to see what these programs are and the percentage progress they've made through them. But what it also does from a back-end perspective is that any time we can press a button and see any one of the 4,000 individuals, 
we can see any one of the stores and the percentage progress as a store. You roll that up again, any one of the regions, any one of the divisions, and you've got some great MI coming out the back, which helps us to drive programs because you stick that MI in front of the store managers and the regional managers, not that they're a competitive bunch, but they want their stores to complete the learning first and they're driving it very hard. So that, that really helps us by way of driving programs, not only the accessibility, but the MI and the ability to, to feed this stuff out. If you look on the right hand side, so in effect, I've clicked on onboarding and I've got my onboarding plan there. So people are new to the organization. We don't stick them in the classroom till the second week. What we do is we stick them in the stores to get that experiential learning guided through Fuse. So they've got lots of bits and pieces that they go through in, uh, in, in order there, or not in order. The little green ticks demonstrate what, what they've been through and what they've not. The key to this is it's nugget size. It really is kind of two or three minutes here, two or three minutes there to kind of play into those lulls within the, uh, the, busy, the busy store environment. Um, and a lot of these are videos, video driven. Um, so what, what, I'll, what I'll do in a second is I'll just show you an example of a video so you get a feel for the, the types of videos we're doing. But we do try and use um, the guys out in the stores you know, rather than, you know, professionally done. We do try and use people out there. And one of the techniques we use, in particular with onboarding, is uh, it's called deconstruction. So it's really about an advisor would uh, run through a scenario or, some, you know, act out a scenario, um, usually around uh, potentially a sales cycle and the different stages of the sales cycle. But we top and tail that. Their manager would introduce it and say, they're going to do this, watch out for X, Y, and Z. And then they'd, at the back end, say, great, that was a great scenario. Did you notice how they did this, this, and this? So affirming the, the kind of the skills we're looking for. Let me show you a little example um, play out on here. Connect is where we first interact with our customers. First impressions are so important. We need to make sure that we are greeting the customers and allow the customers time to look around if they want. Let's take a look at Kerry doing this. Hi, okay there. Do you need any help? Yeah, I'm just interested in taking the iPhone 6. Okay, cool. My name's Kerry. What's your name? Dan. Perfect. Do you want to come over and take a seat? Yeah. Notice Kerry's warm and friendly smile and open body language. This in so you get you get an idea. Yeah. And and those those are actors, those are you know guys that they actually won store of the year uh, in two, uh, 2014. They come from the Wigan store, so she was the manager of the Wigan store and, and that was one of the advisors. And it and it kind of it really lands well with the other guys across the estate because they know who these people are and it has a lot more credibility than you get in randoms in or even trainers in to actually act that out as well. Um, so that worked for us. So that's, that's, that's what we call um, formal uh, push learning, structured learning. The second P is around pull and pull is really around performance support. Um, we don't need the guys to know everything. We just need them to know where to find stuff and we need to make it really, really easy and quick for them to find stuff. So uh, there's a number of ways in which we can do this and a number of screens which they can use. First one is really around search and going in and being able to search for stuff and the right stuff kind of appears instantly for them. Um, or we can look at topics. So topics is a way of us grouping content, catalog, another word for it, but grouping content into something that means something to them. So whether it's product or whether it's system or whether it's process or skill or the comms vault or back catalog, they can go into there at a click of a button and instantly see and access what they need. Uh, one, of the, one of the big users, uh, or one of the big uh, topics that's used well is the Siebel one. And it's low tech. So, nice one page PDF documents around our most common uh, uh, trod paths uh, of Siebel journeys, customer journeys. And quite often the advisor would have the terminal up in front of them doing the Siebel transaction whilst talking to the customer, whilst on the mobile phone just following the path. So, you know, you know performance support in, in real life scenario. And then finally, you've got the home um, uh, uh, screen there. Again, if it's relevant and, and if it's uh, quite recent information, it would appear in that um, knowledge feed uh, on the home screen. So the third P is post. Um, and this is really about the kind of the social learning, the ability for us to extract knowledge out of experienced or talented advisors and managers and share it across the broader estate. Um, and what we found is, again, this is really, really powerful because it's coming from the peers and there's a lot of credibility and respect amongst those guys. The, the trick to this is making it really easy. So setting up the community infrastructure, which I talked about earlier, and then just having the capability of getting their mobile phone out, pressing the record button, 
literally doing a two minute selfie of how I'm smashing it with my insurance targets and this is my pitch and then another click and it's posted for all 130 in that region to actually see it and share it. We've also got a leaderboard uh, which again the competitive nature it sharpens the minds a bit so they get points for learning they get points for um, collaborating, so that's liking and commenting and things like that. And they also get points for contributing. They get most points for contribution, which is when they post content up themselves. So again, let me just share a little example here with you. The one I'm going to share with you is um, our Kent region do, uh, it's a bit like the Ice Bucket Challenge. I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of a year or so ago. They do similar to the Ice Bucket Challenge. And the, there's, there's two or three rules that, that are set and then they kind of get on with it. So they've got to do a, a little short video in store of something that the other stores in that region would find educational. It's got to be humorous. And at, at the end of it, they've then got to stitch one of their other stores up and pass it on to do the next one. So let me just give you a, a little... Take five. Hello, and welcome to Kent Fact of the Day, where I'm going to tell you about Bofan International. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have some wonderful offers for you where you can get international free of charge for our page customers. Totally free of charge, now all this back. All you've got to do to get Vodafone International is you have to text the word international to 2345. How easy is that? If you don't want to do that, all you have to do is go over here, you can call three Quite informative because it's talking about our roaming services, so people are getting refreshed on that. Quite humorous, and then he, his geography isn't up to much, uh, much here, as you'll see. And all he has to do is ring China for one and a half per minute. You can ring China for one and a half per minute. There you go. One and a half per minute. China. Or he can ring his mum. His mum's Indian, right? She lives in India. So he can ring India. And then, and then they need to pass it on. So this is him passing it on. Canada, China, India, USA, one and a half here. So that is the Kent fact of the day. And now I'm going to hand over to the Folkestone store and Mr. RGB and the leggy blonde. Thank you. So that's all right, as long as our HR team don't get hold of that anyway. So, so, so that's that's what we call the, the kind of the social, the social learning and the um, and the, the kind of the post as we call it. So those are the three elements under learning and performance support. The next key thing we use it for is communication. So it's really revolutionised revo 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 the way we do comms within uh, the retail environment. You know, I, I painted a picture a little earlier on around uh, how it was previously. But what this has enabled us to do is get communication right out to the palms of the hands of all the advisors and managers across the estate, all 4,000 guys, instantly. So you can have an important message goes out there, and within an hour, you've got a third of the estate who may have read that and digested that. We can also track the penetration, which is great. We know what's landing, we know how it's being received because of the comments and the likes and things like that. And it's really changed the way we do it. Quite a lot of it's video, but it's, it's video that's um, not, not laboured, it's done very quick, but with a professional spin on it. You know, the guys have taught themselves in the comms team to kind of turn around videos within a month. And it's often quicker to do the videos than it is to write a comms um, at the end of the day. But they're still written comms, kind of one pages, nice one pages around what's happening uh, or what are the deals in the stores and so on. L let me ask you a question before I come, to, come on to the next point. Um, how many uh, within your organizations, how many uh, of the learning teams sit in the same kind of function as the comms teams? Yeah, just a, just a handful. This is a kind of an eye-opener for, for us in, in doing this, in particular um, using the technology, because to the end user, they don't really care whether I sit in a learning team or a comms team or the quality assurance team. It's just stuff to them that comes on their mobile phone that's relevant to them and makes them do their job a lot easier. Yeah, and that's what we're finding. The boundaries between what the comms team are doing and what the learning team are doing just, are just becoming increasingly blurred, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, and those teams now, as a result of this, actually sit under the same manager, which makes them even tighter as well. So it's really interesting, the kind of the observations that we've seen through that. 
So then the third element that we look at uh, is continual performance improvement. And we do this through observational assessment within the app. So again, I talked earlier about the importance of quality data, building those communities, but having you know, quality data coming from your HR system. What it also means we can do is a manager flips out the phone and instantly they've got the six or seven guys who work for them within their store. They press the, the guy they want to observe, customers in, there's a conversation going on and they're observing the customer conversation um, around the framework, the sales framework or the, the service framework and observing whether um, you know, they've seen that behavior demonstrated uh, or not. What you get out of the back end of that are two or three things. One is a coaching conversation using the GROW model. So uh, whether it happens instantly or you know, the following day, usually instantly. So they're getting feedback on how they've gone on based around the framework and what they're being measured on. And secondly, you get what their strengths are and what the skill gaps are. From a skill gap perspective, at an individual level, they can go on and watch videos and look at um, little performance support material on Fuse to bridge that gap. But from a central L&D perspective, what you're actually getting there is data that you can roll up to store level, regional level, divisional level, which actually starts to become a bit of a needs analysis so that the next thing they push out across the estate is really focusing on where the, the key skill gaps are. If you look at the flip side of that, you look at the strengths. So if you've got you know, the Folkestone store, for example, who are you know, smashing it at selling accessories, then so if, if the performance says they're smashing it you know, the way they pitch accessories, what you can then actually co correlate that to is the finance data for that store to see where there's a you know, correlation there between the revenue that we're getting from accessories and their performance in how they're pitching accessories. So really starting to get up to the level three, level four kind of evaluation of, of, of the learning there. And we started to see some, some nice green shoots from this for that correlation of performance and revenue. Um, so again, we're gonna pursue that further and further with the reporting and how we hook into the finance guys to, uh, to start to demonstrate that. Okay, so that's the, the various areas uh, that we, we cover off from learning and performance, from communication and observational assessment. We underpin this with our operating model. Um, so as I said earlier, it doesn't matter whether it comes from the comms, L&D and QA. And because of that, they don't own it individually, they own it as a collective. Um, so they've all got some skin in the game and um, you know, they all wanna see Fuse progressing. So we, we, we have a governance kind of um, team and meeting that I chair each week, and that makes joint decisions on how we progress things. So it's decisions really around um, our strategic program roadmap, our priorities, any risks and issues. I'll kind of pick up with uh, the supplier management and Fuse to look to progress things with those guys, and also looking for industry best pra practice of what's going on out there that we can kind of feed into the operating model as well. So that's the overarch governance. Underpinning is the support. So we've now got a guy who's full-time on Fuse, he's a Fuse specialist, um, and what his job is is to make sure um, the data's accurate in there, the infrastructure stays accurate, um, the input of content is good, the output of content, so it's data in, data out, and dealing with any queries. But to be honest, we're probably lucky if we get, or unlucky if we get one query a week into the help desk with things not working. Uh, it, it just works because it's, you know, it's an app and it's on the phone and they're so used to it. So you don't get a lot of overhead with issues. Um, it's generally kind of content that we spend a lot of time creating. And then like anything, this is early days for us. Um, this is really about um, you know, continual improvement, building on what we've done and looking to get better each, each and every month as we move forward. So that's the operating model. I'll share some, uh, some results with you. Um, we're, we're pleased with them, but I'll, I'll let you guys be the judge of that. Um, so 97% of uh, uh, active users we've got across our estate. So as I said, there's about 4,000 or so guys in there. 97% of them are actively using it. Probably about 10,000 items per day um, are, are viewed. One of the key facts here that amazed us, uh, but also kind of, really pleased us with this was that 30 percent of usage happens outside of work hours 
And we put that down to a number of things. Accessibility is, a, is an absolute key thing. But you saw my uh, original screen of the homepage where they've got WhatsApp and Twitter and all, all their kind of you know, personal apps. And it's just sat there alongside them. So when they're bored of that and they finish doing what they need to do on that, it's just easy for them to tap on it and they're seeing what's going on at work. So there's that kind of element to it. There's also on the bus in and the bus out of work or whatever, it just makes it so easy for them to access stuff. And when you start to pull the data, 30% is massive, really massive. And you know, from getting information out to them, that really helps us with not only making use of those troughs, but also making use of time we didn't have previously outside of work. And then you've got some uh, kind of advocacy figures around, you know, recommending it nine out of 10 to other people and so on and so forth. Um, from a cost savings perspective, We've got, or we're spending 70,000 more hours a year with the customer with the result of how we now deliver our learning. And we're able to save 56% on our uh, learning delivery budget from what it would have cost us doing it um, through our previous methods. Um, and three examples there, I've already shared one with you about flipping onboarding and reducing it a day. So they're in the classroom second week, not first week. Uh, our service programme, a big service programme we've rolled out, rather than it being three days, we're able to reduce it to one and support it through Fuse. And um, our quad place, so Vodafone moving into the uh, broadband and TV market, then we had to roll out some key game-changing stuff in there, and we were able to do it using Champions and, uh, and Fuse. Business performance, I'll not dwell on those, but... Um, you can't hardline this stuff. You can't say Fuse has done this or Fuse has done that, but it's no coincidence that since we've implemented it, volumes have gone up percentage-wise, accessories have gone up 20%, and insurance sales have gone up 30%, which is a, a, a kind of a, a, a real nice kind of bottom line figures to quote. And then finally, um, just uh, finishing on this, um, these few points here then, if I was to summarize then, this wasn't just about switching an app on. I wish it was, it had been so much easier. It's actually been a, a kind of a business transformation program um, to, to kind of get us to where we are today. We really, we've been running for about a year with it now, really encouraged with those results that we've seen in the, in the first year. And I think what, what's most pleasing about it is we're sat in a room probably 12, 18 months ago thinking, in theory, logic's telling me this stuff should work. And to actually see it work in practice across you know, the, the, you know, the real live estate is, is really satisfying. Um, I think mobile and bite size are the future. Yeah, the, the, you know, the days of hour long click next e-learning courses for us are, are, are in the past. You know, this type of stuff, particularly in the retail environment, has got to be the way forward and further afield in other business areas within our op uh, operation. And then finally, uh, for us next, it's about making this sticky. It's about really sustaining what we've got so far, but also increasing um, the usage. And there's a couple of things we're going to introduce in the next couple of months. One is WhatsApp capability within the tool so that we don't have them using WhatsApp you know, um, for, for business. It's built within the tool. So again, that joining up the comms and the learning and chatting about learning within the WhatsApp tool, bringing it together as one. And also dashboard analytics. So we make it really easy for managers to actually get hold of their, not data, but their kind of MI, which actually tells them the stories so that then they can then go on and further embed it in their, uh, in their stores and in their regions because they've got you know, the stories that uh, mean something to them. And that's me. I hope, uh, I hope you found that useful. Um, and I think, we're, are we doing questions at the end? That was really interesting, I think, and, and a really interesting use of a tool and business transformation and, and actually kind of getting results from that. But what questions do you have for Mike on his experience of that? And I'll come along with the microphone. Questions, comments, feedback, reflections? Mike, it feels a little bit like destiny that you've just done that talk because we just saw Fuse downstairs and we were really impressed oh, yeah. with its possibilities. So, you know, I'm totally sold on the benefits and it's great to see how it's actually been applied in business. Now, I'm in the compliance field, so I'm just going to ask you a question, I suppose, about governance. But do, have you had any issues about people putting any kind of um, non-business content up there or do you have to moderate it? Because, you know, I, yeah. I wouldn't want to have to go down that road. I'd be, I'd be a rich man if I was 
you know, get £10 for every time we were asked that question, but it, it's a dead obvious question to ask, and it, it's one of our big concerns at the beginning if you're doing this social learning. So we mitigated the risk by making it, you can only do it within the region, so they can only pu publish stuff that's visible to the region. We also, on the way in their first login, they have to sign up to our social media policy. Yeah, so there's no kind of gray areas, it's black and white. If you mess around with this stuff, you, you, you're out. Yeah, and then the, you know, the third element is it's self-placed. It looks after itself. So if, if you post some crap up there, you're told, <laughs> you know, and it, come, it kind of comes down. And the rubbish tends to sink to the bottom and the cream and the good stuff tends to go to the top with the, the likes and the hits and the, you know, the sharing and all that kind of stuff. So it was a big concern we had and it, it just hasn't played out. Great, thank you. Other questions or comments? I had, I had a question about um, colleagues using their devices on the shop floor yeah. and what customers think of that. Because if I saw the manager stood there doing that, yes, he may be doing a review, but in my mind, there's a guy stood there staring at me on his phone. Yeah, yeah. How does... Um, well, I guess it's a little bit different from us and that's our business and uh, that, that's what they do all day long is show people phones and demonstrate phones. But I get the point around, yeah, um, and the manager's job is to do that whichever way works for them. Yeah, so some of the managers ask the permission of the customers, some are far more discreet, kind of out of the way, and some of them don't do the observations until kind of at the end of it where they, where they have watched it, yeah, at the corner, and then kind of gone on the app after it and actually captured on there so but we leave that to the discretion of the of the manager on you know let, let's be sensible with how, how you do that yeah 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 um you know we we, we wouldn't recommend that the guys do that if there's a if there's a customer in there we, we're trying to make use of the the lulls so when there's no customers in there so it's quick and easy for them to have two or three minutes watching a video if someone comes in they park it but it's not as if they've finished kind of you know uh, three minutes into an hour long course they've probably done it what they needed to do because it's it's so short so we, we really don't want them to do it in front of the customers it's just within the store making use of the time between customers Um, I'm just curious as to how you align with your other regions because I heard a very similar presentation by Vodafone, Vodafone Ireland there last year and that they, they did something very similar. So is it that you model in one region first and then another? So, so we're, we're totally separate businesses. Ah, okay. So um, if uh, Vodafone Group has 23 different markets. So the UK is nothing to do with Ireland. We operate as totally separate businesses. You have a, a listic systems that go across the whole piece, such as Saba or something like that, or SAP, and uh, you know, those are great systems, honestly, but uh, they don't actually deliver you know, what we need to deliver. So you, you'll use that for your, your compliance stuff. Um, but for this type of stuff, it's then down to the local markets on what their need is and how they actually implement that. Um, and so this is purely a uh, Vodafone UK initiative that we're, we're looking at based on our requirements. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. I can do, yeah, yeah, I'm just conscious of it. <laughs> my question, my question's about um, kind of stickiness and longevity. So if it's really instant and people are not getting time to reflect, we're often told that reflection is a key part in certainly in leadership progression and you know that sort of stuff. So I have a question in there about if it's really rapid, how do you ensure the stickiness? Yeah, and I think that's where the formal stuff kind of meets the performance support stuff in that they, they, they may do it once as part of the formal structured learning programme, but it's then always there available for as and, as and when they need it, maybe at point of need or, you know, if they want to do a refresher and stuff like that. So, that, that, you know, that's, that's how we, we try and look at that around the stickiness. It's not necessarily it's sticking, it's them knowing where to find it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.